All right, another podcast from the Michigan Institute of Athletics in Brighton, Michigan. It's going to be a great podcast today. Right before I, I get into it, I want to shout out VetLife. VetLife is a 501c3 nonprofit company. It's a company of veterans for veterans. Every veteran faces struggles transitioning from active duty back to normal civilian life, and VetLife is there to ease that transition. If you want to reach out to VetLife, you can do so through Instagram or Facebook or check out their website at vetlifetoday.org. Uh, so joining me now is my guest, Laszlo. He's a, a military veteran. Um, he really has some incredible stories. I met him through this academy. He uh, brought in a, a dog who was also a military veteran named Emperor, which I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about today. The man's got just some incredible stories, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this podcast. And honestly, with our podcast being sponsored by VetLife, there's no better gentleman that could be sitting across from me today. So Laszlo, for the people that don't know you, let's start to create your story from the beginning. You know, were you born and raised here in Michigan? Where'd you you get your start no i was uh born and raised in youngstown ohio and uh yeah was there until i left i mean graduated from liberty high school um actually went on to college to play i got recruited to play uh, football and wrestling you know and and uh wasn't for me at the time so i ended up in the marine corps yeah but man i tell you what if you were getting recruited as a you know to go wrestle and play football in college you were a hell of an athlete well yeah i mean that was that was my out. Like when I was growing up, you know, yes, if I was born here because of my name, uh, we were, I'm first generation American. Uh, my parents were from Hungary. They were freedom fighters in the 56 revolution. So they came here when they were 17 and they raised our, you know, five kids. My dad's a machinist in his little shop. I grew up in that, but being a little chubby kid, you know, growing up and not speaking English real well, having accents, got the hell beat out of us a lot. You know, it was a lot of where I lived in the inner city part was very ethnic gross, you know, so you had your little bergs everywhere. So it was, uh, you know, in the early 80s, late 70s, there's a lot of um, tension between the groups. Almost like territory wars. It's exactly what it was. Like you had this corner, you had that, 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 that block was yours, you know, we had from the Italians to the Hungarians to the Irish to, the, you know, everything. It was all broke Germans, you know, and it was a very ethnic group because of the steel mills and all the workers who came there early on. So it was really stable, built up ethnic areas. And then you come in there and then you have, you know, we're living in an area that the kids are like, who's these, you know? And you just had that thing. Well, you know, I got beat up a lot for like, yeah, you know, I go to school, I'm just chubby. And I was, you know, you talk weird and you didn't want to talk. But then when athletics came around, you know, he had about ninth grade, tenth grade. Best thing that ever happened to me when I for you know basketball. Everybody wants to like basketball in high school, right? That's the sport, right? <laughs> so then I go out there, and I can't ever have this. This coach walked up to me, you know, you're doing run, basket, and dribble. I couldn't dribble. I just couldn't do it. And he's, you know, he walks up to me, son. See that door over there? You go walk over there, and you go see that Mr. Lot. He's a wrestling coach, and you go talk to him because I think that might fit you a little better. Best thing ever happened to me. And I went in there as an eighth grader and I wrestled. I was a two time state qualifier, state runner up, and uh, was on the U.S. junior team to wrestle the Russians in 1984. It was great experiences, you know. Um, this is the best thing ever happened to me because it only taught you um, humility, teamwork, but also self reliance. Because wrestling, you know, you, you go, you want a mat, you're one on one. It's the only place you can manhandle a human being. Well, now we got all these other fighting things, but back then that wasn't heard of. But you manhandle a human being and not get in trouble for it. But then you still have the team aspect because you have to get the points. So it's not just me, me, me. You got to think what's best for the team. So you came up in a really blue collar family. Oh, I mean, yeah. your parents were making their way here in the country. I mean, a lot of the other places around the world view this as like the land of opportunity, the land of freedom. And a lot of people in other countries want to be a part of this country. You know what I mean? They, they look at this as a symbol amongst almost like a symbol of light in, in a, a lot of dark places. I mean, there's a lot of places that the quality of life is horrific. And if, for as much as people might try to shit on certain things here in America, it is a land of opportunity. And you witnessed that firsthand with your family. What? Well, like I said, uh, my family, the way my, my history, and we'll go through that, and I'll tell you how I progressed through my military career. But you know, my family from World War II, they were children. They saw their, their towns were bombed because they were an industrial town, so they were bombed. And I'll never forget, my dad visited me one time here in Michigan, and the Liberator from the Yankee Air Museum flew over my house. And 
I understood because I have post-traumatic stress. I saw my dad's eyes get, oh, shit, you know, like, and it was that sound. And he goes, you know what that sounds like? A couple hundred of them flying over your town. You know, and you're a little kid. He still remembers that sound. But, yeah, they, they grew up there, and when they were 17, they fought and kicked the Russians out of this country for seven days. You know, but they came back, and, you know, and they were taken back over again through a bunch of garbage. But you ask my dad or my mom today, what's the best day of their life? And everybody goes, oh, you know, it could be your kids being born, could be this, could be that. But July 4th, 1976, the bicentennial, the President of the United States made all freedom fighter Hungarians U.S. citizens at that time. Now, you, they weren't a U.S. citizen until they came here in 1959. They weren't a U.S. citizen until 1976. And at any time, they could have been thrown out of the country. They had a business, they had children, everything. And they didn't bitch about it because they said, this is what they had. Their whole family was over in another country. They couldn't see them. My dad couldn't go back until 1984 because he was considered a war criminal because he was fought against the Russians. You know, but President Reagan, he made it a mandate under, under a proclamation that they can travel home and if you arrest them, that's, that's an infringement of a U.S. citizen and you can't do that. So he got the right to go home then. But you can't imagine, you know, 56 to 84, you couldn't even see your family. So we grew up seeing that. And that's why in today's world, right now as we sit here, it's so hard for me to see what's happening because I've seen it. And I spent 18 deployments all around the world. And I've seen it from the Central America all the way to the Mideast. And yeah, I don't care where you go to worst place here, it's still better than there. I mean, yeah, it's atrocity, it's horrible. I wouldn't want to live this way. But it's worse there. Got and it. people don't guess that idea. It's because it's, it's like, you know, they watch TV. You you can walk outside and get whatever you want. You can go online, type it in, and get whatever you want. It's not like that everywhere. I mean, even what you were just describing, most people would have no idea that life overall, for most people, I'm going to generalize here, is so much easier now. I mean, you, you have your... Your parents came to this country and like you said, at any point could have been thrown out. They're fighting to try to make their own way. They're trying to raise their family outside of the chaos that they grew up experiencing. Mm -hmm. They're trying to like build a better future for their entire bloodline. They can't go see their relatives. They're considered a war criminal for fighting for their freedom. And you know what I mean? And it wasn't until Reagan stepped up and said, hey, you know what? We're going to recognize these people and the great things that they did. We're going to make them U.S. citizens. And that moment, can you imagine what that was like for your parents to find out that we are now welcome and appreciated in this country? You know what I mean? Like, what a moment. Well, that's what I said while I was gone. I forgot. Uh, you asked what their best day was. Well, my dad and my mom will tell you that day when they were made American citizens, the proudest day of their life. I mean, they still love their kids, you know, and that's a great day. But this, you know, you like you know this is a sports complex and everybody looks up there's some really great athletes here and they're like oh that's you know athlete I'm, oh he's so great people look up to football players basketball players and they're like my hero you know and, and i had a question asked to me i went back to school when i was like 30 or something like that and i was taking a class and they asked me you know i had to write a paper i was like an education program and uh, they asked me well you got to write who's your hero and I would listen to these people reading all oh, Kobe Bryant. You know, they're just reading off all these athletes and, and movie stars. And they got to me, and I said, well, <laughs> well, honestly, it's my mom and dad. And they, like, I got literally looked at, like, what the hell's wrong with you, you know? And then I told them, I said, well, can any of you say your mom and dad were man of the year? In 19, 19, what was it, 1960, I think it was January issue, or 1959, January issue, whatever it was. They were man of the year from Time Magazine, the Hungarian Revolution fighter. And I went, I went out and found that catalog. I found that magazine, had it, you know, bought it, had it framed, gave it to my mom and dad. But it's because what they stood for. They said, you know, like I say, you know, people always say, I'll die on my feet, not on my knees. Well, that's not just a saying for me. I mean, I saw my parents live that way. I lost family members doing that. I went overseas. I saw my brother stand like that. That's how I live. And that was all inserted because my parents... My dad always said, you know, you come here, you make what you make. Never ask for anybody to give you anything because that's not a guarantee. Like he said, they got here, they were given $100. They got off the train in Youngstown, Ohio, and they were given 100 bucks. My dad paid that back within two months, and he never asked for another thing. But he, all oh, we didn't find this out until he had a stroke. All the people that he had helped after that, 
he didn't even have it all for himself, but he would give to other people. We found this all out. He never asked for none. He never said anything. We never knew how bad it was in the 70s during the gas price, you know, gas crunch and the, um, the fall of our economy into the 80s. We always had what we, what we needed. We didn't have everything we wanted. You know, you can't go out and like, I want a, you know, an Xbox. I want this. I want that. I want cable TV. I didn't even know what cable TV was. You know, we didn't have it. You know, didn't have a computer until I was in my 20s. In the late 20s, um, not like I kids have cell phones that do more than my, my, my calculator did, you know. Funny story, like you say, with getting what you need, the old man would always say, you don't need a calculator. You know, they come home and say, you need a calculator for school. He taught us on a slide rule. And we can actually work our slide rules faster than the kids can work their calculators. Because he was going to pay 79 bucks for his Texas Instrument piece of garbage. You know, it took you 20 minutes to punch in a code, right? You know, I was like, I couldn't figure that crap out now. And I actually took a, class, a, a, a calculus class in college just in, what, in 2001 or 2002. And they say, you need all this calculator. I was, I was using a slide rule. The teacher, who had probably been 15, 20 years younger than me, he's like, what? I heard of those. I've never seen one. Can you show me how to use it? And I showed him. He's like, holy smoke. That's fa I was doing it faster than you can do the calculations on the calculator. Because that's, and we put a man on the moon with that. But that's the thing is our technology has ruined things. You know, you know, we depend so much on that. And I go back to our freedoms. It's easy to, when you can't do the basics, you fall apart. So kind of what's happening when everybody, oh, we got all this freedom, but you, you lose your eye, your, your mindset. You know what I mean? You lose your pathway. When I was overseas, you know, we, when I was in Iraq the first time, we were putting internet access into all their homes. They had no food. But we were giving them technology. They didn't have running water. But we were giving them this technology, flashing them. We're like, how the hell are they going to use that? I mean, you can't eat the damn thing. But they had them. You know, and this is what I'm saying. Like, you know, we just lose a little what our freedoms are. And that's why, you know, I don't know. I want to talk about when you first, so you made the decision you were going to join the military. Because you looked up to your father and your mother and you said, you know what, I'm going to make this leap. I'm going to be one of the people that tries to fight for what we have. You know what I mean? You were proud of it. You saw your parents, you know, work their asses off to make their way in this country. And you said, like, I'm, listen, I'm going to defend the freedom and the right that all human beings should have that, right? So I'm... When you joined the military, what branch of service did you go into? And then let's start to talk about, go all the way back when you first got in. What was it like? What Your pathway up? And then we'll keep going from there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, well, I said, well, I finished my first, my first, you know, what, I got through the winter college in college. I went and played football and got, blew my knee and had to have surgery. So I couldn't finish the season, but I got back in time to wrestle that season. But then again, I was 18. I learned how to drink, you know, and I was like, ah. And it was legal drinking age in, in Ohio, so... It just wasn't working for us. I was having too good of a time. And I said, my, my brothers, I had a twin brother in college, a sister and a brother in college. They didn't have the opportunity. I had some help. And I couldn't put that on all my parents because I was just wasting it. So I said, you know, I'm going back in the military. I wanted to be in the Marines. I joined the Marines. I walked into a recruiting office on uh, June 17th, I think it was, of 84 or 85. And I was gone on July 1. I was reporting to the base in, in uh, South Carolina. And I fit in just like a peg, you know, it was perfect for me. The structure was great. The mission that we were learning was what I wanted. And I believed in it wholeheartedly, you know, and I started out, it's just, uh, like I said, I was an athlete, so I was in great shape, I thought. You know, and you think you're great, you know, I was a wrestling, I was, I was just come off a wrestling season and I was wrestling Greco, the Marines saw that. So they, they even said, you know, you finish this up, we'll get you on a team. Maybe you can get onto a base team and then work your way up the ranks. I said, great. So I ended up in the military. I went, I went to a, um, went to boot camp in uh, Paris Island. And that was great for me. That's where I met my brothers. I had family members and I had four siblings, a twin, but I made in boot camp in those 14 weeks, I made better friends than I've ever had in my whole life. And I'm 54 years old now. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it is that so many military people truly make these deep connections that they go beyond blood and beyond these things? You know, the way I look, I mean, the way it's for me is I never had to ask myself. The question was never there. Am I safe? Do, I, do they have their job? Are they doing it? They got my back, right? We always hear, I have a thing about my, my program, 12 and 6. I mean, you never had to, it was unequivocal. You didn't have to think. 
are they protecting you? Are they doing their job? Are they going to go, you know, are they going to screw you? You know, I don't care where you're going. Any job here, don't matter what it is, everybody's trying to one up because I want to get that next step, that next level, you know, and you have to do whatever you have to do. There we didn't, you know, and I think that's why you build it because you go through the same things. They shave our heads. They take all your clothes away. They take everything you have. They give you what you're going to get, and they make you all have the same exact thing. No one gets more. No one gets less. So you learn that we're all the same. And again, I told you, I grew up in an ethnic neighborhood in an ethnic area where... Yeah, your differences were pointed out, man, and held against you. And all of a sudden, you you weren't allowed to fit in with certain groups of people because you're not like them. Now, all of a sudden, you have people that are showing you that, like, we're all human beings, and you're all in the same thing. You know, I... I I, I grew in the city, so I was I was exposed. You know, we were exposed to different nationalities, different races. We had guys coming in from the south. You know, they never met you know a northerner or a union. You know, and some never even met a black person in their life, or some never met a Jewish person, or anything, because they were so segregated in their lifetime. And then you get here, and you know, you're thinking I'm better than them. And here, no one's better. It's either light green, dark green, and any shade in between. But that's what it is. And you'd learn that and then it realized that there's a beauty in that, man. There's a beauty in that simplicity. If we looked around at each other, like we're all just brothers and sisters together and we're going through this life experience, trying to do our best, that's a better existence. And you, you basically got a taste of that in the military. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the part about that was, um, my, my, I would say my best friend that is Martin, he came about, he was from uh, Birmingham, Alabama, or right outside of Birmingham, Alabama, and he was redneck as redneck can come, right? And uh, we'd have our talks, and we are like, God, you know, this is where I grew up, and we just started talking, and, and our realities that we, we, we experienced were so polar different. But then we started talking, that, that, that became our conversation, that became our friendship. And then we worked together, like I made a guide position, which was the, the highest you can get in a boot camp position, and then he was, he was our scribe, which is like the second high. So he does all the recording for the boot, you know, for everything during boot camp. And usually you don't carry it all the way through. Both of us, I carried that from the second weekend. We carried it all the way through graduation. We were honor graduates. And, you know, and then we ended up going to ITS schools together, infantry training. And we just born a, a bond. And we left it. We, we parted for a while. But every time we ran into somebody from that, we had 72 guys in our platoon when we graduated. You ran into almost all of them at one point or another during that first two years we were out because we all ended up in the same bases. And that brother, as soon as you saw him, that brother who was there, 40 years later, you know, 35 years later, we still see each other, we talk, and it's like it was next day, you know what I mean? Because, you know, even though we haven't seen each other physically, it's that brotherhood connection. You know, if you call your brother, you ain't seen him for months, two months, whatever, a year. And your family member and you talk and it's like, okay, we're right there. That's how this is. Tighter than I am with my own brothers. Man, there could be something to be learned from that in society. Can you imagine if that was just our family structures? If people had each other's backs like that and you know that at any moment, any of your family members, they know they're a part of, you know, the, the same legacy that they had your back like that. I mean, there's a beauty in that, man. Cause like when I grew up, I had a really close family on one of my, on my mother's side and they were always together. They were always like bringing joy to each other's lives. They were always, they were just always there for one another. And we don't have that anymore. If things have gotten split up and I tell you what, you, you long for that. You miss that a lot because there's a certain connection that happens when you have human beings that like see the similarity in each other and and like they i want your happiness you want mine and we're going together there's a beauty in that man it's and it was uh it's that whole trust thing too like like i said i have i have brothers i have a sister and uh, brothers and i did my job while we're working through i was at its school you know and um got in and it was probably 86 and all that. I started going into my, my tech training and I went into cold weather expert training schools out in, in um, Bridgeport, Cal uh, Bridgeport, California, did training there and then ended up in Minnesota and the Greenland. And I was good at what I did. So you start getting recognized, right? So you start getting some training opportunities and get some movement and laterally movement. And um, it was funny because I didn't see Martin for almost two years. And then we ran into each other when we were getting, we were being interviewed or, or in a selection process to go on the recon, second recon. Well, at Reto was just recon, first recon, second recon, don't matter where, but we're trying to get into a recon battalion. And we ran across each other. 
So that, again, was like all the time. We haven't, we haven't seen each other, but we were brothers again, you know. And even though we had friends there and you're helping each other, that, that friendship really was tight. But we always helped each other. I mean, we had problems with great, you know, you know we were learning the, the run. The first time I did my run, you know, pull-ups, push-ups, um, all the nomenclature, all the, all the batteries of testing, great. But then you had that 10-mile run. And you had to do it in a certain time on it, but you're in full gear. And I missed it by like you know, 40 seconds or something like that, in between 35, 40 seconds, and I was sick. And then the next one, you had uh, six weeks train, don't pass it, you don't go. That's it. That's your choice. So you can either hold off and hope to get into a new rotation or do the six-week rotation. So I tried for that. But then I had those like Martin, he hung out. He passed it. And he's like, I'm staying here. I'll help. I'll train you. I'll stay every night with you. Worked on We worked on it. We worked on it. And it was great because, you know, we got through the testing again, got to the run. And I'm not saying, oh, it was a miracle when I did by I only passed it by less than, less than you know, 50 seconds. But um, not a lot of, not a lot of leeway. But I, I picked up that 40 hour and I didn't make it because I had him to help me, you know, like overcome some of that, that doubt that I had, you know. And you do have some doubts when you fail, even though you're still part of this group that, you know, you're doing better than most. I felt like I was a failure, and he helped me get back through that, and then it started growing. And we did get into a recon platoon, and we went to our trainings there, and that's where I actually excelled. Because now, you know, the Marines were great, but I didn't have time for, I, I didn't like the political part of it. And there was a lot of that. When you're in a regular battalion and a regular training groups, there's a lot of that, you know, I don't know. There's some elitism. I'm not going to say it's all brother because there's elitism too. You know, you get that just, but it's society. So you do have that, but that's, that's on a very small minuscule part of it because most of the time you got great, the brotherhood, the, the camaraderie is, is fantastic. And I mean, you witnessed your father and mother being freedom fighters. So at the end of the day, you're not just trying to be this starter level. You're trying to climb through the ranks and really excel to that stature. So now you made recon. And, and you got to realize that at that time, we're talking uh, 1987, 88. See, I was born. We were, yeah. And, and, and I was at the height. This is like, you know, we were really big in, the, in the, the communist movement was really growing around the world. And I hate him. And, 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 I, and I know it's not right to say, but in my heart, because I know what they did, I just have a really a communist. And I just, I have no love for them. And that's where I was exceeding, because I was like, oh, we can go stop this. The push was going to Central America, right, to go down there to help these people to stop this influxation of, of the communist socialist rule coming that was coming from Russia, but it was coming from every angle down there. And people don't realize how bad it really was. You know, they you say Iran Contra, and they think, oh, you know, well, that was, uh, we were breaking all the rules. I didn't know I was breaking all the rules then. I was just doing my job. But we went down there, and we spent time there, and we did what we had to do, and I loved it. And again, I excelled more and more at this position. And uh, I was approached then, and it was probably 889. I was approached by some fellows you know, at, a, at, a, at a conference we were at for training in, in Bethesda, Maryland. And they say, hey, are you interested? You know, how much do you really want to expand upon your, your, your goals here? What are they? So we talked and they said, let's meet over here. We got want some testing for you. I was like, okay. I really didn't understand what's going on, but I was like, okay. You know, they were brought here. They're obviously something to do with the military. So I met them at a Holiday Inn, went to a room and took just a ton of batteries of testing. Everything from written expression to mathematics to, um, I don't know, I'd say cognitive skill testing. And then they said, okay, we'll get back to you. Then didn't hear nothing. You know, I was like, oh, you know what, maybe I didn't do good. Then uh, the invasion, you know, Iraq war starts. And we went there and, you know, I spent a month there, and people say, oh, it was nothing. You know, well, and then you're looking at the wrong books or something because it was a whole lot worse than anybody was telling it. You know, they're on the news here. We're like, oh, we just got in, and it was over. No, I mean, that was the first time we gave us anthrax, anti-anthrax pills, you know. Didn't even know if they work, and nowadays made us take it. Uh, and I have a whole issue with that now we think it's all from that not just me but hundreds and thousands of guys but when we went in there you know the oil fields were burning you remember that well you i don't know if you remember that because you're just a little kid right but you heard about it and literally you can see where it was 
Think about standing outside in the middle of the night with big flames around you, and it's raining, right? But the rain is oil, you know? You're saturated all the time. You're breathing it in, you're moving, and you have hostilities around you, you know? It was crazy, and there was a lot. They, they think there was a lot. Of, there was a lot of death. Not on our side. We lost some, but it wasn't like we had in the second round. But lots of their guys were dead. And not, not only got children, women, I mean, it was everywhere. Cause why, the, why were the casualties so high for, like, women and children? They bombed the cities, you know, on the outskirts. And the thing is, is they used them as shields. They put their, they put their weaponry, they put their anti-aircraft guns on top of apartment buildings. Well, you got to take out the apartment building. You got to. And there's nobody. You know, there are people there. They put them by schools. They put them, I mean, something that we look at and say, oh, we, you know, that's animal. It is, but you gotta understand on their aspect. Now here we are, we're Americans, we're free. Brits are free, the Poles were free. Everybody's going there is literally kind of free. But they love how they live. I mean, I'm not gonna say they loved it. They didn't like their dictator, but they have a belief system that that's all they knew. We're coming in and we're gonna tell them we're taking rid of that. Lots of them liked to, they didn't want us to take their religion, but they wanted to get away from the power. Again, power, absolute power is absolute corruption. That's what it leads to. Doesn't matter where it's at, business, home, life, friends, whatever, whoever's the big guy in the building, abuse it eventually. That's what happened there. I mean, can you imagine you're walking down the street? Who say says, I want that girl. They pull, they grab her, beat the hell out of the guy he's with or whoever she's with, take her away, and he has his way with her. She either lives, she dies, doesn't matter. He don't care. It's a toy. That's how they lived. You've you witnessed things like that. It's well, we hard to even that, hear that. We heard that firsthand because um, the folks, when we got there, when we went there in the very first invasion, we didn't go to Baghdad, but we, we were in there and we talked to the people. We should have went. Norman Schwarzkopf said, let's go to Baghdad. Let's shut it down. The people wanted us. The Kurds wanted us to help them. You know, because they, they were being persecuted. But, yeah, we have the stories that we're talking to these people that we're interviewing, and they're telling us all this. And we're like, you know, I'm sitting there going, how the hell can this even go? And then the war's over, right? And we give it back to them. We pull out. That's what we thought. Remember those guys who pulled me into that room? I swear they came and started talking more. They said, how much do you really want to stop this type of stuff? Communism. What do you want to call it? Communism, socialism, fascism, uh, totalitarian ship, whatever you want to call it, what's happening that's not free. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm all about it. Because you're going to say, we're a little brainwashed too. You know what I mean? They, they teach us. You know, bulls will bounce off you. You can do whatever you can do. You're the, you know, they're a Marine. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. So next thing I know, I started getting some great training. Then 94, 93 comes around. You know, we were in Iraq, right? I got sent back to Iraq, but, but not as a, we weren't invading it, but we were there helping. We came from all over the world. They got guys from everywhere. We were working with Kurds then to build a force to take over Saddam Hussein. And backing was coming from our government. I spent a year and a half there training with troops, infiltrating, getting guys to, to actually turn against their people, against their leader. They say, we want to make a better, a coup attempt, right? Then two nights before it's going to kick off, then now they're accounting on us for advising uh, air support artillery. And we get the call saying, we're not doing it. But we're talking like 1,500 officers, count tens of thousands of troops, especially tank battalions and, and, and infantry are going to turn, expecting us to be there. Well, <laughs> two nights, we didn't have enough time to get the word out to anybody. And we left them high and dry. And literally, they were decimated. And that's why, I mean, I how, do you, how do you look back and understand something like that? Like, uh, that's why I'm in therapy, you know, because you um, got to know all these people. You thought you were fighting for a cause. You thought there was this benevolent attempt. And then basically you just, like you said, left them out to dry. That is a crazy thing. Like I, I couldn't imagine getting to know people and we're training together and we have a plan to try to stop this bad thing from taking place. And then where does the order come down from that decides, hey, you know what? Forget all those people that you just got to know. Forget the cause that we just put you on. You're coming out of that situation and whatever happens to them happens. That's where it. does that come from, Laszlo? Again, the only way I can look at it, that's greed. 
And again, they, instead of taking them out, they said, well, you know what? We got to leave him there because the ramification, his, his position of power, they're able to abuse it and use it more than who would come to power. They, they just didn't think about it. And you can know, and, and I never thought about it when I was in war school, war college and learned to be for NCO school, go back to the invasion of the Bay of Pigs in the 1960s. I think it was 68, 60, whatever it was. They told the Cubans, uprise against Castro. We're going to be there for you. We're going to pull our troops in there. You got, And again, at the last moment, they pulled the Americans out and they were all slaughtered. Reason being, why did Castro stay in power for so long? Is because he was less of two evils that they can put there. Because who knew who they're going to put in charge there? Again, and this is what happened in Iraq. And then, you know, Saddam, you know, he, he played their game. And it's the same thing. During, you know, during the 80s and up until the 90s, into the 90s, that one bad man, Osama bin Laden, remember him? He was training right here in the United States. His men were here. We had trained them all through the 80s to fight off the Russians in their country. And so then, because I have a hard time grasping a lot of things that take place, what would make him turn and, and have a plot to, to try to, you know, absolutely shatter America with the 9-11 events. How does that take place when at one point in time he's training here in America? We're assisting him. We obviously have endless intel on him. You would know him very deeply. You would know his family connections, where he resides. We would have all the information on this man. And yet somehow September 11th, you know, 2001, that takes place. How does that happen? Oh, uh, my personal feelings on it because, I'm, again, I worked in this world um, – at any time, do I think that he was pro-American? No, 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 no. No, he, he was pro his establishment, his way of life, you know, his Muslim belief system, his idea of having their world the way they want their world. You can't argue with that. I mean, that's what we want. That's his idea. Well, when he was fighting the Russians, he's getting help. Well, I'll take the help. I mean, you can't blame him for that. He was given some of the best training, equipment, everything. And he used it. He didn't mean he changed his he, – he more or less said, you know what, I have to eat for the better of two evils. I have to do this so I can get this to get rid of them. And then they beat them. They beat the Russians out of their country. Hell, they, they beat, they beat um, the Romans. Now they beat, they, they beat every attempt that came into their country in Afghanistan. They beat them out of their world every time. And now he's saying, okay, we got all this help. The Russians are gone. And then – the Eastern ideas and all that, and the Western ideas started to flood their economy. They flooded, flooded their world. They didn't want that. They didn't want equal rights for everybody. They don't want kids going, women going to school. They didn't want girls going to school. They didn't want, you didn't have a voice, you know. And here, all of a sudden, they're starting to get a voice, you know. Their way of life is changing drastically. So it's basically a major threat to their way of life. You see this other country that's out here promoting freedoms and doing this and women are on the come up and we're trying to make equality and we're doing all these things. And that basically is against everything that they've been indoctrinated to believe in since that's, they were children. That's all they believed in. That was their religion. That's like you telling me that Jesus Christ didn't exist. Jesus Christ was a, a prophet and he's just a prophet, just a man. Well, I don't believe that. I mean, I'm a Christian and I believe Jesus Christ is my savior. They believe Muhammad was theirs, right? They knew he. They didn't say he was a god. They said he was a prophet, and he had the word of God. And he did. They believed that, and they believed all this stepping. Now, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, then we can go right back to it. We did the same thing as Christians. We stoned them. We we beheaded them. They cut your hands off. But when we had the, the healing of our Savior, who who gave everything he had for us, to, so we can be free, they don't think that way. They have their beliefs. So. It's crazy that a lot of the things parallel, Laszlo. Well, when you look back and you go, wait a second, we persecuted anyone that didn't believe just as hard as they exactly. did. We did the exact same things as they did. The crusades, you know. hundred percent. And I look at that and I say, well, but again, and I say just like this, if we, you or I were born there, I can say for myself, I probably already strapped the, a vest on and went and blown something up. Because I'm willing to go to countries I don't even give two bits about 
and I was ready to die there unequivocally, do my job and do whatever I had to do. And you, you subscribed to the story, man. They told you a story from the time you were young and you subscribed to that story. And, and some people buy into it fully. And it's, it's, I know I actually have good friends that are, you know, of every religion, uh, Catholic, uh, Christian. I have friends that are Muslim and many other things. And here in this country, they don't live by a lot of these ideologies anymore. So it really seems like your area of influence, the environment yeah. that you grow up in and stuff brainwashes a lot of people versus like, I love that when you earlier in your story, you talked about like when you got all the bullshit out of the way, the background, religion, social status, color, you realize you're just people. Yep. You know, if you could just um, go into that when I was there, I mean, my Terp, love the guy. And I got to look at him when, when, when he came and worked with us and he did interpretations and, it, and it, he was giving everything up. People don't realize that, okay? He came there. If they found out who he was, they don't just like just like remember when you hear the stories about you know what what um, everybody saw uh, like Goodfellas and shit like that all the mob stuff right uh, what was it? Godfather when they go at you they take everybody right that's what they do they they eliminate your bloodline okay he he's there helping Americans right they don't just kill him they kill everybody associated with him so here he is he's here interpreting for us. He's sacrificing everything. And then when we were done, we tried to take him home, you know, get him to the United States. That, that was, everybody thinks, oh, yeah, that was what's happening. That was not what was happening. We were like, hey, see you later. Thanks a lot. Very few were able to come here. And it took a lot to get the ones who do come. It's a lot to get them here. We opened the open borders. Now, folks, I mean, yeah, they got a bad life. They want to get here. So be it, whatever, come the right way. These guys gave up everything to save American lives. And they couldn't come here. That's very bizarre, man. Hearing this from the outside, it's like someone that's willing to help you that much, that's willing to be against the evil campaigns that are going on, that is putting not only their life at risk, their loved one, their families, everything. How can we not look out for those people? I don't... We think about it. I mean, because we're thinking, oh, yeah, we, we thought it was going to be, yeah, no problem, get them here. And it wasn't. It man, wasn't. just the regulation, legislation, all the loopholes and all the things that... That it's just gross. You know what I mean? Hearing yeah. these stories, I can't imagine being in your shoes, knowing the person that had just sacrificed so much to try to help a cause and to just have to walk away from them. That would be something that would just eat me up. Well, like saying, like family, right? And you think, oh, we have all this great. I, yeah, I went back to this. I have a sister, a twin, and a younger brother and an older brother. My sister refers to me as a Bush murderer because I went to war for Bush. No, I didn't go to war for Bush. I didn't go to war for oil. I didn't go to war for only the, for freedom. That's how I looked at it. Not my freedom, but the folks over there to help them get freedom. Now, they can still have their religion. They were still Muslims. A lot of them were um, Chaldean, which a Chaldean is a Christian, is a Christian Arab. You know, it's, it's not like a rough, they're just, that's what they believe. They have, their, they have Christians, they have Jews. I mean, it's an area just like here, but I was going to help them. I wasn't going like when I, when my sister, my sister, she, you know, she sold out. She, she bought into another idealism that, you know, what I was doing was wrong. I don't, I haven't talked to her. And you know what the, you know what the crazy part about this is you signed up and subscribed to try to try to do the right thing you try to bring freedom to other people you witness your family go through this struggle and now here's the thing is there's so many pieces being moved way beyond your control there's so many strings being pulled that you're not a part of there's so many things that you wouldn't have done but you're literally following orders hoping that the system that you work for really is a benevolent one if not you're almost just like you went in with an idealistic viewpoint of like i'm going to make a difference i'm going to be that man that is freedom for some people and really if the wrong Wrong strings are being pulled and the wrong pieces are being moved you're almost you can almost be a weapon of destruction even without meaning to you know what I mean so that is a that's a tough road man yeah I mean like, <laughs> like, like, I, say, like I, I had to deal with that you know I, I lost a family member I have other family members still look the younger brother older brother like, I did never knew exactly what I did because I just kept it wasn't I didn't want to talk about it um, do you feel mostly good about the service that you did or do you like how now that it's 
in the past and I'm sure you reflect on it daily and you look back over your life because how could you not? Overall, from the man that sits here across from me today, when you reflect back on all the events that you lived through and the things that you did, do you have an overall, like, you know what, 80% of it was good, even though the 20% is evil. How do you reflect on your entire wow. times in the service? That took, that took me getting injured to realize it. See, up until that point, I had a great life. Um, you know, like I said, I got recruited. Well, what I was being recruited for is I left them. I, I left the Marine Corps, but I didn't leave the Marine Corps. I, I, I went to a, a, a group, a society run by the government. Uh, the guys that we talked to, yeah, they were CIA, all right? But we weren't CIA. We were just a group, and there was hundreds of us. And I loved it. I mean, we had training. We had everything, all the toys, everything. We were doing and then we thought we are doing good, you know? Then in 2012, I'm home. I mean, I always got to work. I got to work, do what I love to do. Summertime comes, I was a teacher, right? Summertime comes, I was gone. I didn't want to go, I didn't go. I wanted to go, I was out. You know, and I went to work for three months. And again, there it is, I've gone for, I'm gone for six, eight months. And then I go see my brothers again, and they're coming from other places too. And it's like, oh, we never left, you know? And then here we are thinking, we're doing good. And that's why I became a teacher. So I was working with kids to help them learn so they can have a better deal. And I was an industrial ed teacher. I was a, a, a CTI teacher, career tech ed, right? I taught machining, CAD, all that. And that's what I thought. I'm doing good coaching, coach wrestling, coach football. And I was giving kids a better idea. You know, kids who had bad, you know, and, and I was in an affluent area. I started out in Detroit. I went to Fowler Road, I went to Howell. You know, and all of them are pretty, you know, except for, even in, I taught at um, John F. Kennedy High School in, in um, Ferndale bad area but still good kids right kind of tough but we helped them we thought we we're giving good went to file over good stable area right economic wise it's not the greatest but go to how got a lot of kids but you know what a lot of kids were hurting there and a lot of those kids are the ones i was getting in my classroom so that helped me right and then i'd leave and i'd see all this garbage and i'd come home and i felt better because look i'm here and i told my students i said look how bad it is you know but it's not that bad you know and then then I got hurt. I, got, I was out for a ride. I was going. I was training to get ready to go back. It was uh, May. It was Mother's Day in 2012, and I got hit by a truck on a motorcycle. Besides all the broken bones and everything, I had a brain injury that, you know, I passed away on the road, and I came back. And this is where the change happened. Because I kept asking, where's the lady at? The one who was talking to me. And they're like, what lady? I said, the lady, the brunette, the lady. She was here, you know. There's no lady. You know when they say you die and people say, I saw a light and it was all calm and peaceful and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, I didn't see no light. And I heard her talk and I heard her telling me I was going through my battle check. I thought I was, I thought I was actually checking myself, right? I thought I was looking at myself. I wasn't. And I was talking to this lady and she kept calming me down and telling me, that's the only thing I saw, darkness in her. No light and I was in tons of pain. And then all of a sudden... You know, it's light. I'm laying on a road. I'm laying on a road. They got all my shit cut off of me. And I got my legs upside. I'm looking at my leg. It's upside down because the femur was ripped apart. It was all broke up and everything. My hip and my neck and my back. And I was like, what the hell? And they said, oh, he's back. You know, and they stabilized me. They got me to the hospital. And two days later, they couldn't understand hell of things I was talking about. I had a brain bleed that they didn't catch. And I started having, I had a brain bleed on the back of my head. You know, and then I started doing all kinds of issues. And I ended up pretty bad. Couldn't speak right. Uh, couldn't walk really good. Besides the injuries, I had a spinal injury too. And that's why my left side doesn't work so great. And I spent the next what, two years in real uh, cognitive rehab, speech rehab, really working on it. And um, that's when all the thoughts start coming back. What the hell did I do? I saw darkness, right? Is that a payment? For all the shit I did prior. And I talked to a doc and a priest, and they're like, Oh, you did it for the greater good, you know. And I still to this day can't find anywhere where it says killing people is okay. Now, prior to my savior, it was okay. They killed, they sacrificed, blah, blah, blah. After that, you don't kill, right? It don't say you don't kill except for this. So what I was killing for, actually, I started thinking in detail, was for some men sitting at a desk saying, we don't like this. And I started having problems. I started talking to other vets. And they, a lot of them feel the same way. 
we we wouldn't trade what we did. I mean, if you asked me today, would I go back? Probably would. Would I do some of those things different? I probably would. But would I go back? Yeah. Because if I wasn't there, my brother wouldn't be there. He wouldn't be here today. And then some of those folks that we saved wouldn't be here today. But I'd question more, or maybe not question it, but I wouldn't be so free with my aspects of some of the things I did. You know, I think I did some horrific things where we could have done a cleaner, quicker, but out of our own. Like I lost my, I remember go back to Martin, my buddy. Uh, we were kicking doors one day, uh, and I didn't have a family. He had, I had gotten divorced by now, and I lost my daughter. That's what led to our divorce. And it's a lot of violent garbage. Um, but two years after that, it was like 2006. And I was there, it was, I think it was end of July, towards the end of July. And we were kicking doors and we were in Iraq. And I always went first, because I figured, you know, something bad happens. He has a wife, has a little girl. You know, this is how it went. And he was second anyways, I, I had some up on him. And we were working, we were working with the Army and with the Navy guys and, and some of the Marine detachments that were where we were at. We were out by uh, Mosul and uh, Couture and all these, which, it was getting pretty bad with these insurgent crap and all that. And uh, kicked the door one day, and Martin's like, I want to go first today. You know, it's, it's a high, right? It's, it's a high. And then he kicked the door that day. He went in. He went right. I went left. And the next time I'm laying on the ground, I'm like, what the? You know, I can't say. I mean, I was like, what the fuck is going on here? I felt like someone ducked a bucket of water on me, you know? And then I realized it. That's my brother. And by the time I could sit up and open my eyes right and focus, I saw the dude leaving out the back door. Did you get shot or what happened? No, he he uh, he triggered an IED. And he was gone. I mean, uh, but at that moment, I wasn't sad. I don't think I cried until no, I, 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 I not until 2015. No, 2015 during a session with a doc. Right, that's when tears. I had tears. I didn't cry, but I had tears. You know. But at that moment, hatred built so strong in me towards all these people. And that's where I, that where I can go back. I would do things different. But up to the, all that after, I mean, I still would do it, but mm, I think I would try to curtail that hate that I had because during that tired of hate, you know, we unleashed what we would call the sword of Gideon. You know, we would wipe shit out and we didn't care, you know. Which now I'm dealing with, you know, and I gotta say, you know, the last four years of therapy's helped a ton. That's why it, you know, we'll lead to that, you know, and that's, but yeah, you know. When, you, when as someone that's, ne I've never done military service, and when you say like kicking doors, so you're out there, like, what are you searching for? What is the, like, what is the reason? Because like, imagine if, if let's say that uh, tomorrow an invasion happens in this country where a communist party communist China is trying to take over America someone kicks your door like you're gonna fight back mm -hmm. you're gonna do everything you can to not allow this and even if let's say they're saying over their media and all their people like hey this is for the good of the world we're gonna do that we would fight back right right so when you're over there and you're you're like kicking doors and stuff what is the purpose behind it? what are you looking for what are you searching for what happens if you find people in the home like what as as a civilian on the outside what is the purpose that time what our purpose was is all all military aged fighters were males should have been gone not there actually no one should have been there you know they were supposed to be cleaned so when we were going in because we were going in to use it for overwatching you know be able to set up positions to help protect as the guys were cleaning rooms in front of us or inside of us and uh you know we'd look for weapons and we'd look for information computers any anything that we can find anything that can be used we would look and see if it was there if people were there and they took off you know can we find anything that they were using what was it? we could look for ammunition weapons whatever but our main objective was clear the house get to the top and make sure the fellows who are moving around are, are safe you know we're looking for threats and as other groups what they were doing we call kicking doors they were going in to, 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 to clean the houses out to see if there's any threat if the guys who aren't supposed to be there aren't there blah 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 you know and because they were full of people, I mean, and, and like you said, yeah, you kick my door in, <laughs> I'm going to fight back. And I feel bad because sometimes, like I said, my partner lost my partner, right? A lot of times, 
you know, they they didn't comply, and it was like, you know, it's you, you only got. It's like a, I can relate to the police that's on the street today when they walk up on a person and they reach. You got not even a second. You know, you got nanosecond to make a decision. Is it right or wrong? Right or wrong, you make that decision. That's it. You, because you're not thinking about, again, you're not thinking about oil. You're not thinking about their free. You're, not thinking about, you're thinking about just saving your life and the guy standing next to you. That's it. You know, and unfortunately, yeah, there's times probably, you know, innocent people. We're put in a bad situation, used as fodder by the bad people, and you know, yeah, I, I would again, death, you know, death was upon a lot of people there, and that's that's what I don't want here, you know. And then you can, I can relate to, you know, because uh, you know we're not, they're not third women, I they're they were in cities, you know, they they might not be as pretty as ours. There's still cities, you know, where people are living. That's know? what I'm picturing. I'm picturing literally it's just someone's home. Like you're born and raised there and now a military force kicks open your door and you're, you're a little kid witnessing your dad get taken away or you're the fa – let's say you're the father and you someone just busts down the door with your family. Like what – it's just such a chaotic – there's no good in that situation. No. And they're, no, they're saying, well, they shouldn't have been there and they, sh they should have left and but, blah, blah, blah. But wait a minute. No, you're gonna tell me to give my house up? You're gonna tell me to walk that's away from I'm, everything? That's I what own? I'm thinking, man. Like, yeah. how are you tell me, hey, get out of this place? Why? That's my home. This is where my family's born and raised. You know, yeah. and, and and I can see them fighting back because I would too. I think if if you just put it to just a blame thing, you know, don't even ask the question. Just you know, it's the guy who says, "Oh no, that's wrong." Don't you know? You just wait till he's sitting at home. You kick his door in. You know, they, they say, "Oh, it's it's fine to kill him." You know, kick your door and see how you act. You ain't gonna sit, if you sit there and don't do anything, I just, I, I just can't, I, I, you know, there's something wrong with you, you know, and I, and I, and, and I empathize with those people, but then I went right back to, it's either them, you. And that's the, you, know? you hit on a really great point. That is the same exact thing that police have to deal with. I just saw a shooting on, on YouTube the other day where a guy was, he, this, these two officers asked this man to get out of a car for like, I'm not exaggerating, probably 10 minutes. And then it kept getting more escalated more. I mean, the guy tried everything in his power to talk to this guy, like, just get out of the vehicle, man. Just get out of the vehicle. They had already pulled up that the guy was wanted, but they were like, and then it got worse, worse, worse. They finally ripped this guy out of the vehicle. Turns out he has a gun hidden in his lap, pulls it out. I mean, shoots the one cop right on the spot. And then you hear the other cop instantly just like, what the, and bam, shot in the face. It was over so unbelievably fast that like how could you not carry a level of paranoia every single moment that like that one time where you're just trying to pull somebody over because they're they're speeding in a kid zone and you're like, you know what, man, hey, step out of the vehicle real quick. That could be the last moment of your life. How could you not carry an extreme level of paranoia? And when it becomes that uh, me or them, you're going to have to make decisions that if you reflect back later, you might be think oh man i shouldn't have done this or i shouldn't have done that but in the moment you can't have that thought you have that thought and the guy did pull a weapon on you it's game over yeah one of the hard parts is too when we were traveling throughout afghanistan you know in the, in the hamlets or the villes or, or going into the cities the kids they throw rocks at you and i'm not talking a little rock we're talking baseball sized rocks and shit they throw it at the vehicle store that guys and guys would get hit you know but every now and again then I throw a grenade. You know, you don't know. So, you know, we can't, sh you're not going to shoot little kids, right? You, you put out with pop flares, you know, you shoot these little pop flares out and scare them. Pretty soon, they know they ain't going to hurt us. So that now your enemy start using those kids. See, they're very, you can have a lot of influence over the kids, you know. And uh, these are the bad people. If you, they're not going to hurt you, if you throw this grenade, you're helping us. Right. You know, and, and shit like that happens. So then you got guys that are, you know, they see it happen. So now kids are throwing shit. You know, now you got to tell this, you know, you got to tell a 19-year-old kid, 20-year-old kid who just, you know, earlier heard the stories or seen it really happen. Now how are you going to control that? How, how are you going to react? You know, you see the kid winding up and, you know, again, you have that. You know, they say, well, you can't shoot. You got to have this. You got to have that. But how do you, how do you, how do you really disseminate about that? Because you're like, you're trying to save your own ass, you know? And a lot of that, those, those questions are hitting these young kids because, you know, this is a war of young. You know, I was considered an old man in my 30s and 40s there. I was an old man, you know. And most of the kids I saw that were coming in, you know, they were in the 20s, some younger, but a lot just in their 20, 22 years. That's where they were at, you know. 
here and there with the with the NGs coming in or the reservists, you know, you had older guys in there because, you know, they were getting called up. But the average force was young, and you, you're putting that kind of, you know, you're you're putting this do it or die, you know what I mean? But Life then or death decision You're making. putting all these restrictions on it too, you know. Now, when I was there in the beginning, <laughs> it didn't matter. They had a weapon. They didn't have a map. It didn't matter if they were there when they were supposed to be there, you shot them. Now it's like variable cause. Do they have a weapon? Are they a direct threat to you? Are they firing at you? They were shitty shots, you know. They would shoot, and they can't. You may maybe shooting, you know, something over your head or way below you or way off to the right. But they're shooting at you. They just ain't good. That's not considered a threat because they're they're not getting close to you, right? So you can't shoot them. What about when the next bullet hits you in the head? Exactly. But see, it's not a viable threat unless they're being accurate fire on you. And not only you, you have to have a witness for it, right? That's where it's at. You know, people don't really, the people don't know that. Go look it up. Look what the REs, man, rules of engagement are. They are really, really strict. I can tell you a story about a, a, a group of Marines. They were, um, you know, like by publicists. I don't know how you put it, but you know, the, um, what do you call it? You know, when they, not publicists, but they you know that, you know, they go out and they try to work with the people, you know, to show them the good part. You know, it's like public relations. That's it. They're a public relations group and they had, um, uh, hands with them, Afghan nationals. <laughs> and I can't believe they did this, but they sent this group of guys in into a valley. The, the, the city was in a valley. They sent them in there. They're going to talk to these elders. They're going to work this out, blah, blah, blah. So they're getting in there and they get ambushed, right? They're getting slaughtered. And this is where it'll drive you insane. They're calling for help, air support. Well, the grid they're in, they couldn't find the guys in charge of the air support, right? So the guy, the officer, because these officers, are, and this is about rank, right? this is where the political crap comes in, right? If you're an officer and you don't get a command in a, during a war, whoop, during war, if you don't get a command of a, of a combat group, you're pretty much not going to get any more promotions, right? So they're getting these guys and they didn't give a shit where they were coming from. They're putting these officers in charge of these grids. And they had, they had shit stacked up forever, but they couldn't let them in because they couldn't get the, the guys in charge to, to give them the okay to do it. And guys were getting killed. Marines got killed. A lot of AANs got killed. Um, and finally, they got it opened up, you know. But you got you got pilots that were like, fuck it, I'm going. And they got in trouble because they went in and saved lives, but they got in trouble, you know. So Did, you did 17 tours, you said? 18. I, I traveled 18 between Central America, Iraq, Iran, and um, Bosnia. Man, that's incredible. What was the highest position? Like, I don't know if you had an official title or what your group was, you know. Oh, yeah. When you climbed up in the military, what was, like, the highest? I was a, I was a, I was a staff, staff sergeant when I left. And I guess I got paid at the rank of a staff or a gunnery sergeant. If you look at the money-wise, um. But, but we didn't hold titles in our. But you were a specialized group, right? The group, the the the, the we would call us contracted. See, with the CIA, we worked for them, but we weren't actually CIA. Like agents. independent cr contractors we for this. Independent. Thing. We worked for them. We were actually buy it for them. We didn't have a a, a separate company that. Sounds like this. you worked for the CIA without them taking ownership of the fact exactly. that you worked for the CIA. That's it's kind of like that, because that's what I'm fighting now. We're fighting to get my records, you know. Yeah. But. Yeah, that's a whole other shit storm in itself. It's probably because a lot of the things that are that have to be done in times of war, they don't want on paper. They well, don't want it think, recorded. I think that's why they had they came to us and said, what the biggest thing was when the guys I work with, we're all recruited during the same period, all for the fact that they gave us, they sold us on, do you want to stop communism? And we're like, fuck yeah. And most of our guys were just like me, came from Eastern Bloc country families, you know, who – your family saw the atrocities and lived through it. So you, they figured, these are the guys we want to go do this. That's why we went to Central America. You know, they had us down there doing, all, you know, all kinds of good How stuff. How many people were in your, your group? Oh, and, and, well, when we go into the field, we had everywhere between 7 and 21. But then we'd break up into groups. Uh, but we always, we didn't, we didn't go out like, you know, we weren't like, like crazy, you know, we two guys in a group going, no, we, we always had at least seven. We had an air attack with us and all that who would call in airstrikes or who could, who, JTAC. And he, we had an air force guy, uh, always. And those were air, he wasn't in the air, he was in the air force, but he was working with us. Um, 
But we had guys that would say, you know, they were Army, Marines, Navy, Air Force. We had a lot of uh, Navy for you know, medical. They were Navy corpsmen that were coming out, and they were getting recruited in. So we needed that. I mean, you, it sounds like you really did some high-end shit. We I don't know how cool this – Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did some really good stuff. I mean, we did sign. There's like a lot of stuff you're supposed to talk about. Of course. So I don't. I don't. But you know, I came out to my uh, my um, VA reps because when we started getting records, we couldn't get them. Now, now we're in, we got the con. We're we, well because of the elections, it's in a holdup. But we got a congressional investigation going right now to get my paperwork. But yeah, I mean, we did. I mean, I'm not gonna bet. I mean, did I do some cool shit that I really got off on? Hell, it was the greatest high. You know, I don't ever took a drug. That was probably the best drug you can get when you get that high, that adrenaline grass you get when you're doing something. You know, I mean, you lived a real life call of kids nowadays play Call of Duty all the time. Yeah, we lived you in, did a real life version of yeah, Call of Duty. Yeah, this is kind of funny because yeah, I, um, we were there when I was in Iraq, and uh, the, the, we had our, our cool down rooms, wherever you want to call place. And uh, they'd have that goddamn, they'd have those games there. You know, I never had an Xbox. I didn't, the best I ever got was Atari, you know. And I, you know, now, you know, it was Pong and uh, like Asteroids and stuff like that. And now I see these, I can't play those games. You know, I watch them and I'm like, holy shit, that thing is so real. And uh, then I find out these guys, I had a group of buddies that um, they were through the internet, right? And they were beating the shit out of all these kids all over the country. Because they were doing, you know, you can play it online, I guess. And they had their group. And it's so realistic that they were using their tactics. And they were wiping dudes out. And they were, and I guess they got, they were just, every day they were in there. It was kind of funny to yeah, watch. There, you know? There's a game that I've been playing. I just started recently. It's called Warzone, where literally you drop into an area. You jump out of an airplane, you drop in an area. And a squad of four people all work together. So you're talking to them on comms. You're clearing rooms. You're right. checking areas. You're throwing grenades in spots. It's Pretty weird, man. So if you had a, a military style intelligence on how to go through areas, you'd do extremely That's well. That's what they did. And we're like, you guys don't get enough of this shit. But you know, they do use that. A lot of those games, you know, we we're talking to one guy, um, and he said a lot of those games came through training that they used, you know, in the service, you know, for visual training or whatever you want to call it. It, I never did it that. makes perfect sense though. Like when I remember when I went through driver's ed, at one point they put these this video on and you were on a computer and like things would jump out and you had to react. So it basically gets to simulate the environment without actually having the repercussions of of a, a you know crashing into yeah. someone. When we would do kill houses, it was the same thing, but they were like pop ups, you know, and they would pop up either a bad guy or a bad guy and a good guy or whatever, and then you'd have to shoot and make. Well, that's where you had to make those decisions. Split second decision. But the problem is. Now you got a guy bump up with a gun, right? And we shoot him, boom. That's the right thing to do. But when you're in the field, sometimes that's not the right thing to do. Because you know what that guy popping up that gun? May not be a bad guy. He's just you don't know. surprised at the fact that you just bust in, he's got a gun, and then you bang. Yeah. It's yeah, a split second it's decision. decision. So, you know, they trained us. They train you, train you, train you. You know, and yeah, you know, it's like playing football. You know, you train all the time. Don't get to play the game. It becomes like, ah, shit, you know? So it was kind of a high and a kind of a, a, a you know, I'm not going to say we wish for war because I think that's our biggest enemy for ourselves. We don't want it. But sh when you go, it's like, you know, you get to do what you got to do, you know what I mean? And since it's a high. And that was a lot of guys come back. And you, can you imagine? Like, I, I, I would I'd literally Thursday afternoon, I'd be in the, in the mountains, Friday, I'd come home, come in, clean up, get everything packed, and on Monday morning, I'm back here getting ready to go teach a class, right? It literally happened. What yeah. an incredible shift of perspective. I mean, you, you know, and, and that, but there's guys coming home after, you know, I was there maybe two, two and a half months, three months. There's guys there a year, they come home and they're boom, they're right on the street. There's no, I don't know how I did it. But I'm, I always told my students, I was like, yeah, well, you know what? I go get my aggression out for two and a half, three months, and then I can come back here and work with you guys, you know? And I never popped off on them. I never had issues with them. Now I couldn't, they won't let me teach anymore because after my head injury, my anger issues are so bad because I'll just pop. And there's no way I can ever work with kids again or, or anybody, like, if, if, you know, if they push your buttons. I don't want to know what, can, what would happen. You know, that's, that's a frightful thing. And um, right now, with with how the world is going right now, with the lockdown and uh, and all that, 
I'm really worried to find out what happens to a lot of our buddies because I know where I was at. I spent two years in a bad place, you know, not wanting to be here no more because I was looking at what I did and I was just having, like you said, I was questioning it and going, how can I do that? How can I be a good person? And I got off on it, you know, and then when I was really mad with things I did, how can I, how can I justify that? And I was really eating at you and I didn't have anybody to talk to. It was before I went and talked to somebody. And then, and just like in July, I had a buddy of mine, he got hurt in 2006. Uh, we had exactly almost the same type of injuries. You know, the, the, the brain injury was the same. The part of the brains that got hurt were the same parts. You know, we had the seizures, uh, the pain, the memory issues, um, anger. And, uh, and and he was doing pretty good up until July, and he shot himself. You know, and we'd always talk. You know, we, we were arguing. So you got problems, man? Just talk. And we did. There were times we just were down, and we had this. But then we got this lockdown. We couldn't go nowhere. You couldn't talk to nobody. You know, and everybody started pulling back. I'd hate to see, I don't think it's 22, you know, I wear this pen, this pen I got from a, a woman whose brother, whose brother came home from Iraq and three days after he was home, he shot himself. And she wore that for, she said, what, eight years, eight and a half years. And uh, when Emperor passed, she was at the funeral and she gave me that pen and I've worn it since then because now that's part of our movement and I'll get, well, I know I got ahead of myself because Emperor, you know, you said I had a dog and he came about because of my injuries. I want to just really quick, and then I want to go to the emperor and a couple other things, but I want to talk about so many people do struggle and face extreme depression and veteran suicide is incredibly high. Do you think that ties into the fact that once you come home and you're out of the environment and you're away from all the things, you start to reflect on exactly what you did and who you think you are now? Do you talk about a little bit I, about I don't that. want to put words in other guys' mouths, but that's how I felt. And some of the guys that I talk to now, it, it goes back to a lot of what we talked in the very beginning about the camaraderie, the friendship, the brothership, the fellowship, uh, the trust. Now we come home, and like you say, you're dumped. And, you know, there, there's some groups you can go to, but, you know, again, they built us to these people that were, we're, uh, we're men. You know, we're he men. You know, we, if you talk about it, you're weak. You can't be weak. You know, if you, if you feel that you're weak, if you feel that you're weak, if you admit to it, you're weak. And we come home and all of a sudden we have all these, these emotional issues, right? We didn't have emotion. Like I said, I, I didn't cry for years. I don't know. It, when you said that story, you busted in that home, Martin got blown up and you were just like dead to it. It's just, you were so in the well, moment on the mission that that is insane that you can train people to well, that level. You, you, Cause that comes to the point. You can't stop. You have to continue. The mission has to continue. There's going to be blockades. There's going to be setbacks, but it has to continue. So you can't mourn. You can't sit there and be all because then something's going to go wrong. Yeah, but think about that. You, they get human beings to completely shut off all levels of emotion. And that's why when you when they talk about post-traumatic stress, and they say post-traumatic stress disorder, and I don't like that word disorder because it's not a disorder. It is a physiological change in you because of stress that's what it is they put the word disorder on it only reason is because the va wouldn't cover the other it has to be a disorder uh 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 um uh, like cancer or this or that so you throw the word disorder no it's not all crazy right all these guys are crazy they have disorders no it's it's a, it's a physical reaction to stress that's what it is it's that's a post meaning after traumatic traumatic issue stress that's what it is and they don't tell us how to work with it I'll throw meds at you. The meds, all that does is, is uh, numb it. So you sprain your ankle, shoot it full of lidocaine. It's still sprained. It still hurts. You just can't feel it. So they numb you up, right? So you don't know how to deal with it. And then you start feeling bad. So then you start thinking, oh, fuck, I'm weak. I'm not weak. I can't say this. I can't come out. I can't go for help because I'm not weak. I'm a man. The weakness is the fact that you can't go for help. I found that out after the fact. I sat in my, I went into my therapist and I sat there because they told me, you got to go talk to somebody. Because literally, I was, getting, I was getting out of vehicles, 70 miles an hour, and I was climbing out of a vehicle to go after a guy who was driving alongside me, flipping us off, right? Now, I don't drive because of my seizures, right? And here I blew up. We're driving along. Guy cut us off, blow the horn. He starts flipping you off. And we're on a freeway. And I'm climbing out the door. Jump, I was going to jump on his vehicle and, and try to go through his window. It was this quick, though. It wasn't like I was thinking about it. It just, it, all of a sudden, I was like, 
And my caregiver, you know, my caregiver is a lady, and she's trying to hold my belt, right? She's freaking out. She's slowing now, but and and that's just one incident, right? So you have you got guys all over the world, all over the country. This is what they're doing because that's your reaction. We're there. Something happens. You react to it. You can't think. You have to react. That's how it worked. You, your life depended on reacting. You can't shut that off either. That's the hard part. Sure, because everybody should take the time. You can in that situation, but in normal life, you should take the time to reflect on things. Right. You should take a second to breathe and, and analyze the proper solution. You should do a lot of these things. And, and that's what the help helps you do. That's what going to talk in groups help you, right? Because now you're not alone. Because you think, and I thought it too. See, when I, before my accident, I never knew I had an issue. I had control of my anger. I had um, productive, you know, I, I was a, a, you know, a, a not only was I good good at my job as a military or a, or a, 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 a war a weapon, but then I got into the school systems and I was great at what I did. I mean, I mean, I wrote training schedules. I my stuff was adapted by the state of Michigan as standards for some of the programs. I didn't have no issues. I get hit in the head. Next thing I know, I got issues now. Now I start questioning everything. I quit. I, I, I couldn't control my anger. I couldn't, and then I have seizures in my whole world changed. Now I'm not this guy no more, right? I can't be left alone 24 hours a day. My caregiver was sitting outside the other side of this wall. Um, That's pretty incredible when you think about the fact that like you banged your head, you had a, a head injury, and all of a sudden it was almost like someone pressed a reset button on you, Laszlo. You almost had to, you started looking at things a little bit different. You had extreme emotion that you had to go through. You had to sort through thoughts. That's bizarre when you think about it that way. It was like you went from being like, I mean, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but like a drone, like that you you could handle a mission, you could shut off emotion, you could get the job done. To like all of a sudden now you're thinking again. You're starting to go. Wait a second, what is going uh, on here? I told my doc, what well, like you said, yeah. I mean, that was part of the problem too with with having this this issue coming home and not being able to work with it because you know you're so used. It's easy to say, Yo, I want to go back. And I'll live with that stress of, oh, will I make it tomorrow? Will I not? It was easier to live that way than it is to come home sometimes and deal with what you have to deal here and look at people. You know, people question you in this. Divorce rates are huge. You know why? Because you don't know how to act with them. You don't know how to interact. You don't talk no more. Why? Because you don't know what to do. You don't know how to act. You, you explode. Um, and it's not fair. I mean, your loved one's sitting here waiting for you. And now you come home and now you can't even talk to him. You can't interact like you used to, you know, and you, you, you're not like, it's not like I'm sitting here going, I don't want to talk to you. No, you're a different person. You just, changed. It's, it's just, it's, you don't know how to anymore. And, and not everybody. There's guys who come home, they're totally great. And that's why these other guys come home and say they can't do it. And then they feel weak. You know, there's something like there's something wrong. And then you say you got a disorder and then they, they're ashamed of themselves. And, and it took everything. I, and I, like I said, I went in that doc and I sat there and I looked at him and I'm like, you know, I ain't talking to him. And he lit, the first one I ever went to, and this really turned me off, I was talking to him, and he's going through, and he looks at me, he goes, well, tell me some stories. I'm like, and I'm sitting in my head going, fucking stories? It's just not stories, man. These are, <laughs> this was shit, you know? So I said, well, you know, these two guys, and I started telling him, this, I just started making up a, a fucked up story, you know? And he was like way off the wall. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, well, you want a story? I'll tell you a story. Do you want to know what bothers me? I'll tell you that. And I think he was just getting off. He, th this guy is a professional, like, supposed to be a like, psychologist or whatever. He wasn't a psychiatrist. He was a psychologist. And he, I think he got off on listening to the stories, right? So I was like, fucking, I ain't going anymore. Then I found this new fella. He was an Air Force uh, officer, worked with guys coming back over there. And he, we, we, I went to him, and again, I just sat there and stared at him. I went there four times, five times. I didn't say shit. I just listened to him and just looked at him because I was like, what's he want, you know? And, and what's he going to do for me, throw drugs at me or, or what? And um, then I was able to talk. We, we, we talked about everything and anything except what happened over there for the first year. And I was starting to be better, you know? And like I said, I, that, that year is when I went and got emperor. And I went and I, I was at a gun show. And I've been trying to get a, a, a seizure detection dog and, and also a companion for about four or five months. And I was on a waiting list here because now it's like you can get a dog anywhere now. But 10 years, nine years ago, you couldn't. You know, it was hard because they're expensive and it was hard to find them. 
Well, you can find some, but they weren't trained yet. You have to go through all the crap. And I needed one that's going to help me right now. And I was at a gun show in Novi, and, you know, I, I'm talking to this fellow. I was looking at a magazine. I saw this ad. So I was like, oh, shit, they're in Colorado. So I called him. Found he's in the prior Marine. He's in first recon. I said, I was in second. And I told him like, what I was doing. Now, he now drives, he, he raises dogs, and he's one of the trainers that sends a lot of his into the military. They don't belong to the military. He contracts them in because there was a shortage of the dogs, and he trains them. They go, they work, they come back, and they go back to him. So he's like, yeah, I got a couple dogs here for you. And he's like, well, let's talk about what you said some more. And then he's, I was talking, and he goes, yeah, well, it's ten grand." And because I was like, what? And that's cheap. That's real cheap. They got over 60,000, 70,000 into his training. Because Emperor, prior to me getting him, he was retired now. But, you know, he was a bomb detection, personal protection. And he had, he had, oh, he was five years old. But when he first went, he went to Iraq twice and Afghanistan. When he was between his two tours, he found like 146 caches of weapons and or IEDs. He protected his, his man, you know, he was with. And he was detected in, in, in I think, in his last tour in Iraq, he was with uh, SEAL teams, with, with SEAL Team 3. He was detected to them. And he worked in Fallujah. Um, uh, I, I forget the other town he worked in, but that's where he exclusively worked through, you know, searching for bombs. And then he went to Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. And in October of 11, they were on a, their job was to patrol into a, into a town where they were building a school for the girls that every day, I mean, they, the guys would work, they'd go home, the Taliban would come in, plant a bomb. You know, so they're trying, because they don't want, again, go back, they don't want education for the girls. So their job was to go in in the morning, sweep the building, clean it out, if it was a bomb there or not, the guys come in and work. So just on that morning, they were coming around and they got ambushed. The handler can't work when the emperor was killed. And they were, they were under heavy heavy machine gun fire, which they only had light automatic weapons. And so it's kind of hard you know, to overcome that. And all of a sudden, that automatic weapon stopped, that heavy gun. And uh, they were over to overtake and involve them. And when they got up there, they found the machine gunner, his feeder, another Taliban deceased. Like, there's no doubt Emperor did the job because of the wounds to their faces and necks. Then they saw Emperor dragging a guy around. He had a good grip on his face or his throat, whatever it was, and he was dragging him around. So Ron, he was another one of the, the, the operators, he put around him and stopped that fella. That's when Emperor backed up and they saw his injuries. Right? His face was all, his jaw was all busted up. His face was all bloodied. His nose was twisted. Teeth were knocked all out. And then they found a knife wound in his, behind his right ear, down into the neck. And then they found one where the tip of the blade had broken off in his skull, on the top of his head. And um, in all aspects, they should have just put him down. That's how bad he was. But they're like, F that. I mean, he saved those people. That's what they said. They, 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 he is going back. A single dog took out four men. That, three and a half. Three and a half yeah. that could have... They could have absolutely killed the rest of the squad yeah, there. They didn't stop that heavy gun. And yeah. why did he attack the heavy gun? I don't, all I know is up above, right? And he's a bomb dog, but yet he yep. went after his handler got shot, right? He still had that love for his team, you know, and he was a protection personal protection train too. So but to go around and hit the big gun, he could hit anybody. But that's the first thing that stopped, right? So he must hit them first. And he was in he had to be injured sometime being between there and the last guy. Um, Stab. I mean, so, sounds like stabbed. He might have got shot, dislocated jaw. That's that's insane. Well, his butt was broken. They said. I mean, it was shattered. I mean, the his, jaw was shattered. You ever see? I mean, I don't know if you pay attention to his face, and it was funky looking. No, if you it look was. At, if you ran your the fingers snout down wasn't his straight. Nose, if you ran his finger down, you can feel the bumps and you know where it was all. Well, they got him back. They, a, a dust off came. They didn't want to take him because they're like the RO says, "No, we're taking your wounded first. You know, and then we'll come." And they're like, "No, you're taking him too." And after. The altercation, whatever it was, he was taken back. And there was no veterinarian there where they had taken him. So a facial surgeon came down. He's like, he, he wired his face up like he'd wire your and my face up. Did a pretty damn good job at it, you know? And uh, the emperor was then flown back and he was taken, eventually taken back to Colorado where he was under, you know, he got mended up, you know? And you know, he, so I had no teeth. 
or very you know parts of them were broken. And what he had, he had a couple, too, but you know most of them were all busted up and destroyed. But uh, he's taken back and 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 uh, after a, I think a year, because he was he was almost four when this happened, three and a half, and within that year, he was he was um, got to an army ranger who was come home was injured and this and that, but he. Uh, he got Emperor home, and then he's like, I don't want this dog. You know, he got no teeth. He's fucked up. Uh, so he took him back, you know, and, and Alex was like, huh, whatever, man. He had a great dog, you know, and then the guys, oh, I'll get mine, whatever. He left and went somewhere else. Okay, great. Well, I called Alex, and I was on a, in the hook, and I was supposed to get this red, long-haired female. And I went out there, and I think her name was Ika or something like that. Boy, she saw me. She did not like me. Because now, when I got hurt, I was like 215, between 220 in great shape. But over that two years, over two years, I gained, I was up almost 300 pounds. Because I couldn't walk, you know, and, and, and then getting depression, drinking, eating. And then the medication that controlled the seizure also slowed your metabolic rate down. So I was, I gained a ton of weight. So John Harris is a big fat guy, right? And she's like, look, she did not like me. No way, no how. She's growling at me. And it, there was just something about it she didn't want. He goes, wait a minute. And he goes back and gets Emperor, brings Emperor back. And uh, first he's like checking me out, you know, and I'm petting him. So Alex goes, let's take him for a walk. So we walk around, we did some training stuff, and we went down in that t into San Luis, you know, walked around downtown, which is like, you know, the size of our block right here, you know, it's nothing, you know, it's just a little bitty town in the desert. And we went back, and Emperor's listening to me pretty good, but, you know, we get a little ways from Alex, and he's like, mm. So Alex says, hey, take him out. So we walk out now in San Lu where we were at, it's 40 miles north of uh, the New Mexico border, right? It is just flat land desert. And Alex is on uh, 400 and some acres there with hundreds of acres around him. There's nothing. So we're out there walking around. And uh, it was funny because I said, you know, I sat down in the brush and Emperor laid down about three feet from me. All of a sudden they start running because they think I had a seizure and went down. And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good, you know? So I look at Emperor and I'm like, hey, buddy, I said, you know, I will take care of you until the day I or you die. I love you. I'll do whatever I have to do. And I says, same thing we always said before we went out on, on the wire, we would go. I looked, every guy looked each other in the eye. Every one of all seven of us, all 21, didn't matter who was going. That's what we did. Everyone went by and said, we will give everything we got. We'll die today, but go home and let people know what we did so that it's not in vain, right? I told Emperor, I will do everything for you. You protect me, I'll protect you, and we always have it. At that, I mean, I'm not talking with 10, 15, I don't know, a couple of seconds. He got up, came over, laid down right on top of me. From that day on, from that moment on, you see, he's never left. He never left my side. He was with me through thick, thin, anything. We came back, and uh, literally we stopped in clear, clear Iowa on the way home. And uh, it was like... That's where well, I wanted to see American Pickers, right? That's where they're at. And they're like right downtown. So we were walking, you know, and uh, come up to a corner and Emperor cut me off. I mean, he wouldn't even let me cross the street until we like checked it, right? You know, he was like, and he wasn't taught that. Again, we were supposed to, he wasn't even taught how to detect a seizure. It was like, he's going to bond with you and it's going to happen. And I'm going to say with three, within three weeks, we were home and, and, uh, I was, I had a little shop where I was doing uh, my rehab work and I was a metal worker. And, uh, so I was doing artwork and trying to machine and all this. And some guy came into the shop and said, Hey, there's a dude laying out in the parking lot with some dog on top of him, you know? So everybody came out cause I was taking him out to go to the bathroom. I had a seizure and that's when we kind of figured out he's warning me cause he was bumping into me and I thought he had to go to the bathroom. No, he was trying to warn me because every day, ever since that, we started watching. And every time I had a seizure, he'd bump me and then lay on top of my lap. And he, I don't believe he missed one seizure after that first three weeks. He detected them every week. I was having multiples of days, multiples a week. And, um, but now I can go places and I felt better because a lot of times uh, I had these freezing seizures too. They're called uh, petite mall seizure where I kind of, you shake so hard, you just tighten up like a statue. You know, and a couple of times I'd be just like sitting outside and I'd be just like this. And, you, and you know, where you have a seizure go down, people can rob you. You know, they take your shit and walk away. And I don't trust nobody. Now with him, 
Now he's protecting me. He wouldn't let nobody come up to my handler or my caregiver would come. Then he'd back off and let her, and then people can come and help me. But until she was on the scene or my other, whoever was with me was there, he wouldn't let nobody just touch me. And that was amazing because he wasn't taught that. And then we'd start going around now. I said, you know what? I had, in that first two years, I had six of my buddies out of the 20-some that would commit suicide. You know, some of them were hurt. Some weren't. They were just having bad times. Six out of the 22. Yeah. You're talking almost 30% yep. committed suicide. Yeah. And, and, and out of nowhere. I mean, we were like, what? I'd get phone calls all night, you know. Uh, most of them never said a word. So then I said, you know what? We got to start doing something. We got to start raising awareness and talking. I mean, Emperor helped me. See, up until that point where I got him, there were days I woke up and I would just sit there. And, and the only thing that saved me up to that point was my fear of going to hell. Because I figured, well, and, and also, who'd find me? Candace. She's the only one who's going to check on me. She's my caregiver. She'd come in my bedroom and see me however I did it. We're out in the woods. They'd find me. And then my mother and father, who never who was always there for me, who helped me through thick and thin. Um, you know, they, they sacrificed so much for all their kids. And even when I was a kid, you know, I was born, when I was born in 1966, uh, a couple months after I was born, I was attacked by the polio virus. After my first, this is my virus, right? I got the vaccine. And I got polio. And, you know, they, they did everything. Doc said, oh, he's going to have surgeries, blah, blah, blah. No, they put me in the hot water, cold water every night. They did contrasting, stretching, worked my legs. I had two surgeries and then psh, never had another surgery again. So they did all that. They didn't have to do that, but they did it. So that's why I, they're my heroes, right? So I wouldn't do that to them. But it was hard. After I got Emperor, though, got up every morning. I had to put them out, right? I had to feed them, right? I had to do this. I never thought about it again. But then I started having my buddies doing it. I said, we got to do something. So we started Emperor's Pride. And that was a go around and talk like we're doing right now, right? Talk about what had happened. And not really about me, but um, how he helped me and what he had gone through. Because, you know, he'd be sleeping. He'd start barking and running in his sleep. He was having post-traumatic stress, too. I mean, you know, he was incredibly highly decorated. I remember yeah. reading about him. I mean, this we're his, talking, you were high-end military, and so was Emperor. He, his team, the guys that he saved, because at that point, then there, there was no awards, you know. They wouldn't get, you know, they don't get. They, so they dec they wrote his papers up and submitted it how they would for any, any man. And they came back approved. You know, they would have been approved for a man, but they, they passed all the criteria. So they gave him, out of the team, one of them gave him his bronze star. And he got a Purple Heart, you know. And he got a Bronze Star with V. Because, you know, Bronze Stars can be done for doing a good job, doing your job right. And then, but with V means he did it with Valor under a combat situation. So that, then this is this, this this Navy SEAL who had – that was his. He gave it to him um, because he said he earned it way more than he did, you know, for what he did. Because he – we all pick. I chose to go. He chose to go. Every guy who's who's in combat today chose to go. No one was drafted. There's no draft. So everybody chooses. Those are true men and women. But he didn't choose to go. He was put in the situation. He said, this is what you're going to do. You're just going to do it. That's it. Da, 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 da. Right? He did it. Unequivocally. He did it with so much love in his heart. That's why he said, we're going to give it to him. And, you know, and I got to talk to, the, to Ron. who was one of the guys there that day. And, uh, you know, he just said how much Emperor, you know, he was, and I don't know, I have a picture of him, that he was just business, you know. He had a look to him like, holy smoke. Actually, if you could send me a couple of pictures of Emperor, like the coolest pictures you have, I can edit them into this podcast to let people yeah. see. Because, I mean, I, Emperor came in this building multiple times. This, and we're talking very at, near the end of his life. Yeah. He was still a monster of a dog. He looked like a wolf. He was all black with the, you know, with the little color on his paws. And you can imagine in his prime that he was just a machine. Yeah, yeah he, he he was something. Yeah, because like he, even when he got, we didn't know. I mean, we, um, well, we went like we'd go to elementary schools, right? And and ever since I was in the Marine Corps, when I was nineteen, I started doing Toys for Tots, right? I bought a Santa suit. I had it fit for me, and it was it was I, it was, it was badass. I mean, they they did it. I met a guy in Bronner's up in Bronner's, and he took all my measurements. He made the suit. It was also awesome. it's a bad suit. I still have it, right? So every Christmas I would do Santa Claus, and so I started taking Emperor with me. We would go to inner city schools, Flint schools, you know, because I, I a lot of those. I mean, those are forgotten kids. I mean, if I can do anything, I went to a school there, and it was 
this really kicked off Emperor's Pride, too, because we went up there two years ago. One of my therapists, Deb, you, you know, she works here, right? She also works in the school district. So I'll, she works with handicapped kids there. And uh, she took me into the school. And uh, there's 256 kids there, uh, I think from kindergarten to second grade. And I'm walking in this building, and it's right at the beginning of the day, and I hear this music, and I'm like, holy smoke, they're, they're playing national anthem. Right? I've worked in the school district for 14 years. Never did I hear them play a national anthem at the beginning of the day, right? And then I hear the Pledge of Allegiance. And I said, what's going on? She goes, well, they've been doing that for seven years since this principal took over. Every morning, those kids sing the national anthem, say the Pledge of Allegiance, and not one time did she get a bitch nothing from any parent. Now, you can say, well, some of those parents don't care, but but nothing, no kickback. So I was like, I'm going to do something for these kids. Because that day, we just had bags of candy. They got their pictures. The emperor's laying there with these kids, you know, and it's like, it's the funniest thing. I never saw a kid walk on their butts before, but they'd like, we'd put them like six feet away, right? They'd be half a circle, and next thing you know, they're right on us, and they never stood up. They just walk on their butts, you know? And then I hear, crisscross applesauce, you know? And they're like, all sitting down, and next thing they're on us, and we pack them up. They just loved on them, and he did not do anything except lay there. He loved every one of those kids. They got to touch him, pat him, you know, and love him. And then they tell the story. And they were like, no way. I'm like, yep. And you would never know. You'd never know. That's what he did. When he was around kids, totally different. We went from Ohio to Indiana. We talked at elementary schools, middle schools about what he did and, and raised awareness uh, for kids. Because their, their dads and moms are coming home, and they don't know how to act with their parents or their kids, right? So giving them some ideas about why it's what, what happened, you know. Because their parents are having a hard time coming home to their kids, too. Not just that their love, you know, their wives. It's their children. Most of these guys had kids. And so we were doing that about three, three and a half years. And, uh, and we started working with the War Dog Memorial, uh, the DAV. We got in there. He's an honorable member. He got his DAV card, you know. And then uh, we worked more gore groups. And we'd go around talking at more events. Uh, the Moving Wall. We talked twice at the Vietnam Moving Wall. And... Uh, People just gravitated to that animal. It wasn't me that they were coming to. It was him, and there was something about him that he had a healing effect. And uh, and you had to bond in the fact that you two were, I mean, like two vets together, man. Yeah. You had both ex both experienced something through different views of consciousness, but that animal went over and served just as you did. So there's a deep connection there. One of the craziest things, too, is where he was in Iraq was the same place I was at. Never seen him. But at one of the times in 2010, we, 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 he was there when I was there. And uh, kind of crazy, you know. And uh, But then this year, you know, he was uh, getting a little slower, you know. He's 12 years old, right? We're like, you know, well, he's going to be 12 in, in November November 5th. But it was like July and stuff. He started slowing. Last year, we were at the moving wall speaking, and uh, they fired a gun without letting us know. And he had jumped off the stage. And it was like a four-foot stage, and he jumped, and he, and he hurt his back. And we had x-rays taken, and he was all good. Then this year, it was a year and two weeks, we went up to the UP, and he just wouldn't eat. So we came back, and then we got back on Saturday, Monday morning, took him into the vet. And it took her in. She did blood work and all this. And she's like, oh, he's, he's great. But I said, he's not eating. She goes, well, let me take an x-ray. And uh, she came out, and she said, well, well, it's not good. We got a tumor, and it's about the size of a football in his abdomen. And that's probably why he wasn't eating, because he was pushing against his stomach and all that. She says, well, um, she says, what we're going to do is come back tomorrow at 11 during my lunchtime. I'll do a surgery, and we'll find out what we can do. But I'm not promising nothing. And at that point, I, he was just being nice then. So right then I called Alex in Colorado and I told him, cause we talked probably once a month, maybe twice a month. And I told him what's going on. And he's like, oh boy. So Tuesday morning came and he was a tramp. I mean, well, I want to take it back. Monday night, a bunch of the guys who I, we have breakfast every Friday, a bunch of veterans and, and DAV guys. And he's always there, right? And he was, a, he was a hoot when we go to breakfast because we'd go to like Mimi's or a, a Hamburg, Coney Island. And he'd go in and he'd sit wherever he wanted to sit under a table, right? And we'd be out in the middle. And it was funny because people would come in and we're like, okay, who's going to sit with him, you know? And they'd climb into their booth and then realize, holy shit, there's a dog underneath here. You know, and it was funny, you know? And then, But everybody started to know who he was, you know, because he was there every Friday. Well, those groups came over that Monday night and uh, 
it was tough, you know, and we realized it. She was just being nice. And uh, and he started looking really bad that night. And then I had a real bad seizure. I had a seizure that went in. It lasts almost an hour. Worst seizure I had in, in, the, in the eight years. And uh, so the EMTs can't got stopped. My breathing was so low. They started doing CPR and uh, they, had take me to, they had to take me to St. Joe. Well, by the time we were headed to St. Joe, I was doing much better. But I was still getting like, IVs in me and all this shit. And Emperor's right there with me. Got his head on my on my lap in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the ambulance. We get to St. Joe's and, and uh, Ipsy, and they stopped us at the door, and they refused to let Emperor in. I've been in that hospital, twenty surgeries in eight years. He's in. The, he's right outside the surgeon door, in the hospital. I'm there. He's in there with. I go there every week, two, three times a week for therapies and stuff. Always with me. Tonight they stopped us. Three security guards. That dog ain't going in. They said the EMTs are like, no, he's that's his ther that's his service dog. You know, he's a detection service and post traumatic They're like, I don't care what he is. Blah blah blah. And I'm listening to this and I'm getting ticked. Right now, uh, between the stress of losing, I know he's not the stress of having a seizure. I'm sick. I tear the IVs out and I go off. Right. And one of his damn little security guards even bumps me. It's all on video. He, like he's like, well, you know, what are you gonna do like, like this is the guy who gives security police a bad name. You know, he's an asshole. And I'm walking out. Emperor's right next to me. The EMT, the female EMTs, the Livingston County EMTs, right? They're fantastic. He's still arguing with the guy. He runs and gets my caregiver because they wouldn't even let my caregiver with me. And uh, the the female EMTs trying to fix my arm because now I, I tore the IVs out, which I opened up my veins, right? So I'm bleeding and. She's working on me. Those asses on his last night treated him like garbage, you know. And I was extremely upset. Tuesday morning comes, and I go home. He, in, in, in all my life, the, the whole five years and, I mean, uh, seven and a half years he's with me. Um, the first night, he jumped in bed with me. Coming home, the first night we stopped in Colorado, he jumped into bed with me, and that was it. No other night did he ever jump in bed with me all that time. Then the last night, Tuesday, Monday night, we got back to my home, went to my room, and he climbed up and slept with me the last night. That's when I knew it was done. Tuesday morning, we got up. There he is. I found him. He's like, oh, you know, good boy, you know. And we went for a walk. We got to the hospital, and it was amazing that, you know, nine guys showed up. Didn't say nothing. They just showed up because they were wanted to be with him. And uh, he and I went for a walk. And the nurse, the doc come out and they gave him a shot. I said, well, let's let him out here with you because this COVID crap, right? They wouldn't let me go in. I don't know why. But, but she's like, they'll, they'll shut me down. The state, you know, I got to follow her. So she, they gave him his meds out in the car. He stayed with me until they took him in. And uh, 15, 20 minutes later, she comes out. She goes, well, we opened him up. And he had a tumor that was wrapped around his liver, his stomach, his intestines. It was just everywhere. And she's like, I, if I try to take it out, he'll bleed to death before I can do anything. And she was, she was wanting me to sew him up. And this guy said, no, no, I can't do that to him. Out of my own selfishness, I could have said, yeah. I mean, that's the only reason we want people to stick around. We, we prolong it. It's our selfishness. And I said, I can't do this to him. You know, he's, he's a hero. I can't do this to my buddy. So I told her, no, can I be with him at least when you put him down? And she says, we'll bring you in the back door. This She's a wonderful vet. Because she, she put herself on the line here, too, because some asshole there could have just said, <laughs> she put somebody in there. But she brought me around, and, and she allowed me to be with him in his last moments. And and I'll go back. You know, we talked, and I lost my best friend standing right freaking next to me. And I couldn't shed a tear. I just couldn't stop shedding a tear here. I mean, I was, I was like, I just lost everything I ever had. I mean, it just, it was, and it, I'm sitting here right now, and it's hard because I still miss him every single day. Um. Yeah, so, uh, but when I called Alex, and this is what I mean, like he climbed in bed with everything that night, and he's like, yeah, it, you know, it's okay. You know, I think that's what he was trying to tell me. It's going to be okay. Alex called me back and said, hey, I got two dogs here for you, but one of them I think you really want to want to look at. And it was Emperor's niece. It was his, his, a female from his litter had it. It was her last litter, you know. It would have been February. It's fe his her birthday's February thirteenth, uh, February twelfth. Wait, no, it's Mar hers March thirteenth. The other one was February twelfth. So 
Brock was that, she's March 13th. So that was her last litter. And he goes, I got her here. And you want her, she's yours. And uh, he even he even said, you know what, got 20 grand on her. We'll, we'll make, don't even worry about it. We'll figure it out one way or the other. We'll figure it out. He's a great guy too. So now I know what I'm going to get, you know, his, his niece. Well, how, I mean, she ain't going to be there that long. So, you know, like we said, there's always a reason for everything. Uh, but boy, the, 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 uh, so War Dog Memorial on South Line, we've done a lot of talks there. We, we worked with them. Um, they love the emperor. And they said, okay, we're going to plan it for the last, his birthday is November 5th. November 7th was, uh, uh, the f November 5th, I mean, was that Saturday that they can do it. They planned it for that. And you know, we, last year on November, we had snowstorms. I mean, it was bad, out, right? And if anybody knows, we went there that day. There's over, over almost 300 and some folks came there. Um, and almost every one of them had an interaction with him at one time or another. The Gold Star Mothers were there from Livingston County. He he was there with them and um, at the Moving Wall. He didn't know, I mean, we didn't know who they were. There was a couple of ladies, right? And he had gone up and all of a sudden he walked away from me. Now that dog never walked away from me. And he just went up and started nuzzling with all those ladies. He, they were Gold Star Mothers. They lost their kids. One of them I was, one of the students, one of the mothers there was Mrs. Kippel and, 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 and she had lost her son. And, and I had, a, he was one of my students at one time. And uh, so they were all there. These people are there. And it was amazing, you know, to see how they, they and the day was beautiful. It was probably, it was like a mid-July day that day. It was gorgeous out, right? Sunshine. And one of the fellas in our breakfast group, I don't know where you know, South Line, it's, it's over on 11 mile or 10 mile and Pontiac Trail, I think it is. And uh, so it's a beautiful day, and this guy, Tone, Jim, uh, he's in our group. He, he, he comes in. He's a musician. He used to tour with all the groups, you know, the, setting up big tours. And we're talking like Stones and all that. So he knew all these guys, right? So he's a great musician. And he said, I want to sing a song for, you know. And, and he goes, and someone, they just take it. I, did, I, did, I said, I don't care what you play. Play whatever. And so they, a couple of guys sat down, and they figured out, and they did on The Wings of an Eagle, right? It's a gospel song. He does. He sings it. It's amazing. He does an amazing job. And then I, I got up to go and talk about Emperor. The whole time I talked about Emperor, people were looking up and they didn't know what they were looking at. And people took pictures. The whole time I was talking, there was an eagle circling above us. If that's not a parody or a, 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 or a sign or something, that don't. It was just amazing. And see, I couldn't see it. I'm glad I didn't because I, I don't think I could have finished my talk. But, you know, and then they buried him, and he's, he's there in the cemetery. And uh, there's a lot of dogs there, a lot of heroes there. And we've gone back now probably a dozen times since then, since November 5th. And I like to go and clean it up. And, and one of the things I've noticed is uh, there are people that are going there. And there's a lot of graves there. I don't know, there's, there's dozens of them. And, but people go in there putting flowers on it. And the pennies because you put coins on, on a gravestone. If you came in contact with him at the time, you put a penny. If you knew him in combat, you put the nickel. If uh, if you served with him, you put a dime. And if you were there today the when he passed, you put a quarter, right? Uh, there are a bunch of pennies there. And there are rocks, too. And people put rocks as a sign of respect and stuff like the, the, the Hebrews do that, you know. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, we go there and every day I clean it off and go back and there's more there. So he has made a change. I mean, and that's a, that, what Emperor's Pride was. It had nothing to do with me. He was all of it. And we go and get it. We go and get uh, Raven. Now you've met Raven. She's a little different, ain't she? <laughs> she is like she's still a pop, but polar opposites in a lot of ways. I mean, she's loving and cuddly and can't get her out of the bed, can't get her off the couch, you know. She wants to be with you. She's She plays a ton. She runs after everything. You know, Emperor just watched you. That dude was on job. You And, and I'd hold his vest out. He'd walk right, get right in there and go to work. And he wanted to work. 
her, I got to struggle with her to put a damn vest on. But once she gets it on, she's working. You know, she and she plays around here when I'm doing my therapy. She runs and chases me, but she still watches it. And uh, it's a lot different, but we're still going to carry on Empress Pride. But boy, does she look like him, boy. Yeah. She really does. I mean, when she, she walked in the door, I was like, that's a perfect fit to carry on the legacy. You know what I mean? And just like has a little bit of remembrance of Emperor forever. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's uh, it's an incredible story. And I think anyone that hasn't looked into Emperor and Emperor's Pride should absolutely see like that dog was a hero and inspired countless people in the talks that you did with children. And I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know. There's just, uh, there's something that will live on way past his life that emperor created you know what i mean and i and i i know you honor and respect that and you feel that you know i remember every day he walked in the door here you could just feel the bond between you two and that dog just had a presence about him didn't he yeah. i mean even the first time i met him he had a certain presence about him that like he he was a like a force of magnetism it just you were drawn to that animal you know so it was um it was something incredible man i, I think everywhere we went he just drew people. I got letters from folks. I mean, like they had a web page. I got letters. I don't know if you remember us. Wow, I met you up in the UP two years ago in a Walmart parking lot. And I'm like. And, and it made you know, a big enough impact that two years later, this person is still writing an email. Yeah. I mean, I got, I, I think we got like, I don't know, 25, 30, in between 25 and 30, like emails left to us on, that, on the page, you know, of people. I don't know. You know, we met you here. We heard you talk at this. But they remember, they said years ago. It wasn't just like, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago. It was over a year or two years, some of them. And, yeah, he did have that. Yeah, man. Just make sure you definitely send me some pictures or if oh, there's yeah. any videos oh, or anything got... like that. And we can clip a little bit in at the end of the podcast for the people that want to watch it. But you and I have been going. We went two hours no straight, Laszlo. No, I... We started at noon. It is 2 o'clock. And man, like it was effortless. It was, it was nothing. So uh, we'll wrap this one up right. here. But please send me some pictures, send me some videos, and I can actually attach them either a link below the video or maybe if you get me pictures up, I can put it so right as the podcast ends, people can see all these pictures of Emperor and you know even pictures from your service days. Let's get it all. Let's clip it in together, and we'll 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 end it with that. Yeah, they did. I was saying one of the guys did a really cool video. It's a couple. It's like a two minutes long or send whatever. that send that to me it's pretty cool yeah well awesome i appreciate you being in the studio today i loved hearing your stories man you know i've witnessed you working hard on your recovery and 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 like just hearing what you've battled through like working to get your speech back and certain movements back and like and you've you've really flipped your mind from such a deep dark place that would have been eating you up to like you've changed perspective and you dropped a little bit of gold in this interview when you said there there's real strength in being able to be vulnerable not a lot of men yeah. view things that way. They, they view that as weakness, but there's actually strength in being able to open up and communicate and being vulnerable and tell people you love them and you care about them. There's actually, there's strength in that. And if more people could find that inner strength, I think it'll help them get through a lot of tough times. Yeah. So man, it was an honor to sit with you here today. Too. And I, I appreciate it very much.